All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening to learn more about this important discussion. Um, before we get started, we're going to read the land acknowledgement, which was written for the University of Connecticut Source Campus in particular. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Eastern Pequot, Golden Hill Pogusset, Lenape, Mashantupic Pequot, Mohegan, Nipmuc, and Scaticoke peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Next, I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting this important discussion, UConn alumni, the School of Social Work, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Women's Center. Thank you so much for your continued support in this programming, and we love to continue to partner with you. Finally, we wanna go over our community rules. You guys saw it in our confirmation email. Um, civil discourse is highly encouraged. Event managers have the right to remove any unruly guests. So we ask that we have a lively and engaging conversation with one another, supporting one another as we learn this evening. Finally, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathleen Walsh, who's on the board of directors of the Yukon Foundation and a Yukon alumna. Thank you, Abigail. My name is Kathleen Walsh, and I'm a proud triple alum of UConn with degrees from both the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the School of Business. Tonight's webinar is titled Surviving Gun Violence. We'll explore many topics, including, but certainly not limited to, the reasons people choose to engage with guns, mental health as it relates to gun violence prevention, gun violence in schools and universities, community-based gun violence prevention, and of course, the importance of building relationships and systems of change, including policy and legislative advances, both here in Connecticut and nationwide, and also how Yukon and our Yukon nation can play a role in this space. I grew up in the 1960s in a home without guns. So the idea that a private citizen needs a gun has always been a foreign way of thinking for me. As gun violence started becoming more and more prevalent in this country, I found myself observing in horror and becoming increasingly frightened to do something as simple as go to the movies. But it was not until Sandy Hook that I finally knew I must join the fight for common sense gun legislation. Like so many other Connecticut residents, I knew people who knew people who had been among the murdered. And I knew others who could have easily been among those killed. A former colleague's children, another colleague's mother who had, was often a substitute teacher at the school, a neighbor's cousin who hid under her desk that morning. Since then, my husband and I have become actively involved with the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence. It is my fervent hope that conversations such as the one we're about to have tonight, advocating for and focusing on solutions will prevent future atrocities at the hands of people who should never be given access to guns. It's now my pleasure to introduce David Hogg, Thrust into the world of activism by the largest school shooting in American history, Parkland survivor David Hogg has become one of the most compelling voices of his generation. On February 14th, 2018, David's life changed forever. As a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, he lost friends, classmates, and teachers. A total of 17 people were killed when a lone teen gunman sprayed bullets from a high-powered military assault rifle. David's call to get over politics and get something done challenges Americans to stand up, speak out, and work to elect morally just leaders, regardless of party affiliations. Passionate in his advocacy to end gun violence, David's mission of increasing voter participation, civil engagement, and activism embraces a range of issues. Committed to becoming an agent of change, he resolved that no other young person should have to experience the tragic impact of gun violence. He joined with friends from high school to co-found March for Our Lives, now one of the world's largest youth-led movements. In 2019, David headed to Harvard University and he graduated in 2023. He recently co-founded Leaders We Deserve, a grassroots political organization dedicated to electing young progressives to Congress and state legislatures around the country. A prolific voice on social media 
With more than a million followers, David uses his platform to promote civic engagement, activism, and voting. As a speaker, he informs, challenges, and energizes, empowering his generation to resist apathy and become catalysts for positive social change. Welcome, David Hogg. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I we're coming up on the two year anniversary since uh, the part the shooting in Parkland happened when I was just 17 years old, and there's been a lot that's happened since then. Um, after the shooting, my classmates and I organized, and we had students walk out of their schools by the millions. And then after that, we organized the largest youth-led protest in American history with over 800,000 people in Washington, D.C. marching with us to demand action on gun violence and millions of others marching with us in cities around the country and on every continent except Antarctica. At the same time that year, we registered tens of thousands of young people to vote and turned them out in districts where their voices could have the most impact. And as a result, we defeated more NRA-backed politicians than ever before in American history as a bunch of people, as a bunch of young people that were originally written off by much of the political establishment and many adults as just being a bunch of naive kids. Uh, we also went to the state legislature in Tallahassee where we were able to change the gun laws despite what everybody said. We were able to raise the age to buy a gun to 21 and we were able to pass a red flag law that has now been used over 6,000 times to disarm people that have been proven to be a danger to themselves and others. Since then, we've continued our, our work. Going through the pandemic of 2020, we helped elect uh, even more of a gun safety majority to the House, Senate, and Presidency. After that, we also continued our advocacy in state legislatures around the country, passing hundreds of gun laws in state legislatures. I think one of the challenges that we have with this work is it's hard to talk about the shooting that didn't happen. But I know from personal experience the power of the laws that we pass. Because unfortunately, somebody sent a death threat to my own mother that said, F with the NRA and you'll be DOA. We use the laws that we passed after Parkland to disarm the person that threatened to kill my own mother. And that may be the very reason why she is alive today. These laws are not perfect, but they do work. Since our progress, since what everything that we did in 2020, we continued our work going into 2022 and beyond. And after the unfortunate shooting in Uvalde, Texas, we mobilized again by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands actually across the country in the two weeks after Uvalde demanding action. And for once, Congress actually did something. We passed the first federal gun law in 30 years, the Bipartisan Saber Communities Act, which expanded background checks for people under the age of 21 attempting to buy a semi-automatic rifle like the Armalite AR-15 or similar type guns. Through this process, what they do is they look at the behavioral records of the person intending to buy this gun. The uh, They call up local law enforcement and talk to other people to make sure that they're not known to be a danger to themselves or others. Because for context, the shooter at my high school not only was a 19-year-old, but was a 19-year-old that had repeatedly threatened to shoot up my high school multiple times. And despite doing so and being reported to local law enforcement and federal uh, officials, uh, they there was nothing that was done. And part of the reason for that is because there was no law in place that could have disarmed him. But since Parkland, we changed that. And today, the state of gun violence has unfortunately, since COVID, gotten much worse. We know the statistics. Having a gun in your household actually makes you significantly more likely to die from gun suicide and others in that household to die from gun suicide more likely than anything else. But unfortunately, because of decades of propaganda and advertising by the gun industry, uh, there have been even more guns that have been sold since the pandemic, especially. And the natural result is more gun deaths, especially gun suicides, which make up two thirds of gun deaths in this country. We have to do more work to address gun suicides, and we have to do more work to acknowledge that most instances of gun violence do not look like what happened in Parkland. Most instances of gun violence happen to individuals and not are in the are not in the form of a mass shooting. And they typically happen in the communities that do not get media attention when their shooting is there, or at least nearly as much as Parkland got. 
And it's not to say that Parkland should not have received the attention that we did. It's to say that every single community deserves the attention and the resources that Parkland got, uh, no matter how wealthy it is or what the race of the people are that live there, because every community in our country should matter when it comes to addressing gun violence. We also have to address what plays into gun violence is not just how somebody gets a gun. Parkland does not have shootings on a daily basis because we have the strongest gun laws in the country. It's because we have some of the most resources in the country. The median household income in my community was over $100,000 a year at the time of the shooting. The best way to prevent gun violence is to give people opportunity, hope, and a way to move up the social ladder. Because when people don't have that, they turn on each other. And we see it time and time again. The number one predictor of where gun violence occurs in the United States is where communities were redlined by the federal government in the 1930s and 40s through predatory lending practices and discriminatory lending practices. The legacy of the systemic racism and economic injustice of that lives on in many forms, including gun violence. It's on, although our generations that are alive today are not necessarily responsible for creating those injustices that have created uh, or been a significant factor in so much of the gun violence that we see happening today, we, we do have a responsibility to address it so that it doesn't happen to future generations. Because unlike with climate change, this issue has been solved in almost every other country, including ones that have guns like Switzerland. But it's not because they have cops in every school. It's not because they have metal detectors in every school. It's not because they have uh, they, they don't have criminals or mentally ill people. It's because they have a common sense set of regulations that says if you want to have a, a gun, you need to go through a thorough system of checks to ensure that you are going to be the most responsible person possible with that weapon. I know, as one final point of hope for you all, I know that we can do this here too, not just because of the other countries that have done it, but because it's been done in America as well. Massachusetts and Connecticut have some of the lowest gun death rates in the country, especially Massachusetts, with a gun death rate 70% lower than most of, the, uh, most of the country. You're still able to get a gun in Massachusetts, but you have to go through a thorough system of checks to ensure that only the most responsible individuals are able to obtain a firearm. I know that if Massachusetts can do that, and those, those laws have been ruled effective and constitutional, that we can do the same nationwide. And there is hope in that, not to mention the fact that young people have been turning out at the highest rates ever for the past three election cycles, time and time again, to vote for people that are going to ensure that we make school shootings history and not headlines. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David, for your powerful words and those call to actions on how we can prevent gun violence in all communities across the country. So thank you so much, uh, David. It's a great way to start today's uh, conversation. Thank you, Kathleen, for opening us up today. Uh, my name is Aswat Thomas. I'm the uh, current vice president of the Alliance for Safety and Justice. I also serve as the national director of our flagship program, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, which is a national uh, network of over 200,000 uh, crime survivors from across the country that are joining together to share our stories, uh, to heal together, and also to advocate for a, a better justice system, a justice system that prioritizes prevention, healing, and recovery as well. I'm excited about today's uh, conversation. I'm excited to be joined by a few amazing uh, panelists to be part of this conversation on round uh, surviving gun violence, but also offering solutions on how we can prevent uh, violence and also help uh, communities heal. Also look at policy and research um, as well. So welcome our, our three panelists to today's uh, conversation. We have Aisha Clark, uh, Joanna Schubert, and also Kerry Racion as well. Uh, welcome to today's conversation, y'all. Thank you, Aswad. It's great to be here. Awesome, awesome. Before I, I get into this conversation with our parents, I want to provide a little bit of background on what led me to this 
uh, work. I'm from the north end of Hartford. Uh, I grew up on uh, Edgewood Street and Albany Avenue uh, in a community uh, that's been riddled by poverty uh, and violence uh, for decades um, that didn't provide a lot of opportunities for young Black men like me uh, to succeed. Uh, fortunately, I was able to do that. I became the first male in my family to ever graduate uh, from college. I was also a star basketball player um, as well. Um, but unfortunately, in, in 2009, uh, while leaving a corner store uh, in uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, on Edgewood Street, I was shot twice on my back, and uh, those bullets uh, ended my professional basketball career and also it nearly ended my uh, life as well. And like so many uh, victims, um, my family and I never received any support services to help me heal from that uh, incident. So we were left to deal with this traumatic experience uh, on our own. Um, but the thing that changed uh, my life was uh, during my last doctor's appointment when I learned that the teenager who had shot me was also a victim of gun violence uh, four years before uh, my incident. And just like me, he was released from that same hospital back into that same community uh, with no support uh, and services. And I strongly believe his unaddressed trauma uh, played a huge role with my shooting uh, years later. So I've dedicated uh, my life to working with survivors to help uh, change laws to remove barriers to victim services, also working to build an infrastructure of victim services uh, in communities across the country as well. Um, so now we'd love to uh, hear from our uh, panelists. We can start with you, Aisha. So we'd love for you to introduce yourself uh, and your background in this work. And also, can you briefly describe the current work you do, whether it's at the micro or macro level related to gun violence? Thank you so much, Aswa, and thank you for sharing your story. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Aisha Clark, and I currently work as the executive director for an organization called Health Equity Solutions. We are um, a statewide organization that prides ourselves in advancing health equity through anti-racist policies and practices. Essentially, we have a vision that individuals, regardless of their race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, will have the ability to live their optimal um, life. Um, and so we, we really work on policies um, at the legis legislative level. Um, to really shift the dynamics, but we pride ourselves of really listening to the community, um, hearing from those who are impacted by policies or practices that are currently in place. Um, prior to that, I worked to work for an organization called Compass Youth Collaborative, where I was the vice president of operations. Um, when I went to that organization, um, I really felt led to to apply and um, was afforded the opportunity to be there. Um, just like Oswa, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, North End, Edge Street, all of the different places. Um, so very aware of the violence that was there um, and the support systems and what it looks like. But tragically, um, multiple individuals within my family um, were um, unfortunately passed away due to gun violence. And so I think about the things that in the support systems that are now um, in an organization like Compass Youth Collaborative, where I said, if there was an organization like that, I really focused on victims and perpetrators of violence and helping to provide ways to help one with the behavioral change and mental health issues. Um, and then also having a person who's there as a, a mentor to help support that maybe my brother would still be alive today. So it drove me to uh, work at that organization and really figure out ways that we can help support young people in the city of Hartford. So just wanted to give a reason on why this is so um, important for me and ways that we can continue to work together. So thank you so much. And um, I'll give it back to you as well. Uh, thank you so much, Aisha. Let's go to over to you, Jaina. What love if you hear a little bit more about your uh, work and that you do related to gun violence as well. Sure. Good evening, everyone. My name is Johanna Schubert. I work at Hartford Community Site Care, a nonprofit in the north end of Hartford on uh, Main and Westland Street, not far from the neighborhoods that uh, Aswad and Aisha have mentioned. I work as the director of our statewide hospital violence intervention program collaborative. We are a group of folks who perform this community-centered and evidence-based approach to working with folks who have been injured by community violence and helping them get to better outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York City. And I came to this work um, through my work with the Jewish Federation, where I worked in their community outreach arm for about 10 years in the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish community, working to uh, unite those who were from different religious backgrounds, but had a lot in common. Um, after the shootings at 
uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School, we brought Marion Wright Edelman, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, to the Lincoln Theater in Hartford. And she challenged us to end the culture of violence and to turn around and look at the violence, not just that was happening with mass shootings, as uh, David mentioned, but those shootings that were happening in our own backyard. So it was really the spark that led me to um, work in the North Hartford community. And I've been there um, almost 10 years now. So I'm excited to be at the table and to hear from my fellow panelists. And um, thanks, Aswad. Back to you. Uh, thank you. And we'll come back to you in the future to learn a little, little bit more about the work of Hartford communities uh, that care. Uh, Carrie, we'd love for you to introduce yourself, your background, and what the work that you do at the micro or uh, macro level related to gun violence. So thank you for having me, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Carrie Racian. I'm an associate professor um, at UConn, and I'm also the director of the UConn Arm Center which stands for Advancing Research Methods and Scholarship in Gun Injury Prevention. Um, so I came to this work through um, kind of a, a haphazard way. I uh, am originally from Texas and I grew up in a house with lots of guns. Um, many were there for shooting or sporting, uh, for self-defense, should that ever be needed, et cetera. They were very much just a part of my life. Um, I wound up, you know, going to college and learning things. And I started an internship actually at the, and I went to college in Nashville, Tennessee and started an internship at the domestic violence division of the Metro Nashville um, police department. And in that work, I learned an awful lot about how guns in the home um, can increase violence that people may experience, either women or kids um, and men sometimes as well. Um, and later I began a career as an advocate for domestic violence victims. And for every victim that I talked to uh, when we were prosecuting cases, sometimes some felt safer after the outcome of a case and sometimes some didn't. Um, at the time I was um, working in the district attorney's office, um, if, a, if a person was convicted of domestic violence, they couldn't have a gun anymore. And I would share this with victims. And for some, it made them feel safer. And for some, they said, Carrie, if, if he wants to kill me, he's going to kill me anyway. Most of, the, most of the victims that had that concern were women. And I got to thinking like, well, what is the effect of policy? And like what does help actually make people safe? And from there, I became a researcher. It's one of the reasons that motivated me to get my PhD so that I could help to answer those questions so that practitioners and policymakers who are on the front lines and doing this job every day can have the data and the tools and the resources that they need to effectively do their jobs because it's what I needed to do my job. And so, um, I'm still very connected to those days of being a, a service provider, though that's not what I do anymore. I carry those stories and those memories uh, with me in my work, for sure. ARMS, I would say, works both on the micro and the macro level. We um, research policies and practices um, through the research capabilities here at UConn, both at UConn and UConn Health, and we do that institution-wide at UConn. Um, as I think you'll hear tonight, gun violence is very much an interdisciplinary topic, and we need sort of all of the best minds in the country thinking about this. And I'm proud to say that UConn Arms facilitates that. And we work with policy and evidence, but today I was very happy to attend uh, Community Violence Interrupt or sort of open house of some projects that um, Connecticut has recently funded and heard the um, strategies that those um, community-based organizations are doing. And, and we work with those organizations um, by, by request to help them with their strategy. So, so we sort of work with whoever will um, work with us and wherever we can be best used with the goal of infusing evidence-based um, policies and research into this work wherever that is most helpful. So thank you for having me. 
No, thank you, uh, Kerry. Actually, I have, Kerry, I have a follow-up question uh, for you. You know, policy uh, and research is critical uh, to this work. So we'd we'll love to hear how do you and your organization define gun violence and what are the different types of gun violence? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that question. So broadly, so when I use the term, so, so ARMS is intentionally named um, gun injury prevention. So we think of gun violence as any kind of injury that a person experiences that may result from a gun. And we think about that as homicide, suicide, um, aggravated assault, any kind of uh, crime that a gun may be used to sort of uh, in the commission of that crime, even if the person is not harmed by the gun, witnessing the gun, that, that creates trauma, of course. Um, we think about unintentional shootings. We think about children that may access weapons and um, through no fault of their own because they're young, that gun uh, discharges and a child is harmed. Hopefully it's only uh, an injury, but all too often it's, it's, a, it's a death. So, uh, and we also think about though, I would say um, not as, it's certainly an area of growth, but law enforcement involved um, shootings as well. So we really think about like if a person was harmed by a gun or if a gun in any way um, increased uh, a violent sort of occurrence or episode, then that's something that we want to prevent and reduce and use research and evidence to do that. Great. Thank you. Aisha, curious to hear from you and your organization at Health Equity. Um, how are you all uh, defining uh, gun violence? Um, so great question. Thank you. So I will concur with Kiri on for health equity solutions. That's exactly how we would define it. Um, however, with um, Compass Youth Collaborative and the research work that we did with Compass and with UConn, um, we defined it a little bit differently. We categorize gun violence specifically with community violence, so hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so it was um, what we would describe as one individual who is now turning over crime to then use a gun to unfortunately harm and or kill someone else. So we defined it in that way. Um, we also called it maybe like street violence, where again, community one-on-one -on -one hand combat um, back and forth with an individual. Um, and the research work that we described and really found out to really help define the gun violence was really looking at um, the ideas of how uh, social media plays a role to having in-person violence and specifically gun violence as well. Great, thank you, Carrie, Aisha. So the, the importance of uh, defining what gun violence and gun violence is is different in, in, in many different uh, communities, um, right? So, you know, as I'm looking at the four of us, you know, I see, you know, I'm an organizer, uh, right? You know, Aisha, you do a lot of the policy expert here. You do both with research and then Joanna, you're a service provider um, as well. So Joanna, Joanna, we'd love to hear a little bit more about Harvard Community Security and the work that you all are doing as well, um, which is on the front lines uh, to uh, violence. We'd love to hear what services and resources are needed to better support uh, victims and, and families that's been impacted by uh, gun violence directly? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So my MSW is actually in community organizing, and I have the benefit of working for an agency that provides direct service. So as you were mentioning, both the macro and the micro, we have a, a team of crisis responders who help those who are struggling right now. And I would um, absolutely amplify what Carrie and Aisha were saying about the definition of gun violence, but just add that we work with a lot of folks who have been chronically exposed to gun violence by living in their neighborhood, whether that means hearing bullets at night or as Aisha mentioned, having family members who've been affected by uh, the trauma of gun violence. So our crisis response team responds to the hospital, meets with victims bedside and their families, um, goes out into the community to help make sure that tempers are cooled, that we don't see as much retaliation as there could be, uh, hopefully none. And then there's a warm handoff to our case managers who work with that victim and their family to get them connected to services that wrap around that family and that victim. So that's everything from culturally aware mental health services to in-home wound care, because we know that oftentimes transportation or not having primary care can be a barrier to healing, 
We make sure that folks are connected to uh, Victims of Crime Act funding to help them through this time. And really any justice involvement, anything that they might need moving forward, we're right there with them holding their hand through it all. Um, some folks need those services more than others, but typically it's about a year that we're with a family. Um, and we're all that we never close a file. We're always there if somebody needs to reach back out. And then on the macro side, um, I in particular am working with um, folks like Health Equity Solutions, like ARMS, like the Department of Public Health's um, Commission on Community Violence Prevention to talk to our lawmakers and tell them exactly how the resources that they have at their disposal can be allocated to best serve victims of crime. So I really have the benefit of being sort of a bridge and working directly with community members and bringing their stories to the Capitol to help change the systems within which folks are injured. Um, and uh, that's really a privilege to get to do. Amazing, amazing uh, work uh, at Hartford Communities uh, that care and just a collective, uh, the coalition of organizations across the state who are, you know, joining together uh, on these uh, efforts from a service provision um, and also from a policy and research, uh, you know, vantage point um, as well. And also engaging the grassroots organizations, you know, who have been on the front lines for, for a very long time. Uh, and those uh, organizations often don't have all of their resources as, as well, right? So, and, and that's consistent across the state of Connecticut where community-based organizations who are um, are the ones, you know, on the front lines to violence, doing a lot of violence intervention work, uh, uh, gun pre prevention uh, work, also helping with families and the crisis. Our response, uh, you know, Aisha, would love to hear from you and think about the work that you did at Compass and also very similar organizations across uh, the state. You know, why is it essential for policy uh, makers to really invest in these uh, grassroots organizations to, you know, to help stop violence from happening, but also help to support uh, communities as well? A uh, great question. Thank you so much. So. When we think about vicarious trauma, when we think about even what uh, Johanna just um, shared about hearing bullets, hearing things, and even the story that you shared in the beginning, knowing that the person who committed the crime were also a victim, it's important for us to understand that this is a cycle. And so if we're not um, going into a space of providing support systems in order to stop or shift behavior, then it's it's a cycle that we will continue to have. And so when I think about our legislation legislators or even different organizations supporting community-based organizations that are doing this work, it's for me, it's a response of do we want to continue to pack jails or bury individuals? Or are we looking for ways to help prevent and or um stopping the vicarious trauma that happens. So if I take an organization like Compass Youth Collaborative, where they utilize individuals' um, second chance and to help support a child's first chance. And so essentially they hire individuals who have been a part of the system and having them be mentors and do very similar work that Johanna has shared, really being there to be a person that these young people are able to confide in help support and other preventative mechanisms. But if there's not money to support that work, then these young people are just out and not having anyone to one talk to, um, feeling as if no one cares. And then secondly, not addressing some of the behavioral shifts that they know that they might not know that they need to have. And so if there's an opportunity to really invest and support individuals, not just like you said, after the violence, but prior to, it's a, a way for us to stop the, the violence that continually to occur. Um, it's fortunate within the, the community that we are in, it's not have been mass shootings. Unfortunately, there is a lot of one-to-one -one shootings that has happened, that is happening. And so the way that we can address that is to really look at what are ways that we could be supportive of communities, especially marginalized communities, those who have been overlooked and misused or really have been a part of systemic racism that has allowed a structure or a box in method um, to be able to prevent some of the violence that is happening within these communities. So if as a state, as organizations, we're coming together to support this work, it's essential to hear. 
Um, and then lastly, I'll just share is at um, a higher level with Health Equity Solutions, we are um, a partner and a coach here for the Commission on Racial Equity and Public Health. And a part of that arm is our criminal justice, um, also supporting the gun violence work. And really essentially the part of that work that we're looking to do now is a strategic plan where we're hearing from communities. And the only way that we can hear from communities to help find resolutions and pass policies is if they are there to to, to provide support for these for, for these individuals. And if they are not there in existence, then unfortunately we again are in this cycle of, well, why are they doing this? It's like, well, where there is a space where there are people who are willing to help address behavioral changes, but if there's not money there to support them, then we're continually being in this cycle. And I always say to people, people will say, well, shouldn't they just stop doing the violence? And I say, behavioral change takes a long time, just like smoking. Smoking takes people years to stop. And so when you're a person who has dealt with vicarious trauma or um, a space of not knowing how to regulate your own emotions, that behavior change takes some time and time takes money. Um, and so we need to invest in these community-based organizations. Thank you, Aisha. And that's how we stop the cycle of violence uh, and also support uh, communities um, as well. And Aisha brought up a good point. You know, Do we want to continue this response of you know uh, funding people back into jails or or, or, or burying you know our our loved ones and our community members what does it look like to actually shift our priorities to focus more on supporting uh families and communities that help stop the cycle of violence um as well uh carrie i wanted to bring you back into the uh, conversation you know on this uh call we have our yukon alumni uh, we also have other uh, stakeholders, uh, whether they are survivors themselves or run organizations or advocates or faith-based uh, leaders and thinking about policy, the importance of advocating um, you know, for resource, advocating for more investments in research as well. Why is it important for us as community members, us as advocates uh, you know, and, and community-based organizations to really engage in uh, policy change, whether it's at the local level or at the state level? Well, I think a couple of reasons. So um, I often say that gun violence is something that like every American has a risk of experiencing. It happens in, as David said in his opening remarks, so many different communities and some communities experience the burden very differently, right? And, and that's important to understand. But if we don't have communities and people engaging in policy conversations, then what we get are policies that aren't responsive to the needs of people. And we get policies that don't work, that it's, it may, it's not that they're tone deaf. If there's not a tone, you can't be deaf to it, but it would have the same effect of being tone deaf. And so we have to have pol policies that are community engaged because we need to understand the problem. And likewise, we also need to have policymakers that know how to talk to the people that policy is going to affect and really understand their concerns. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that carry guns because they think that they need them for their own self-protection. That's true across many, many different kinds of communities. That's not a generalized statement to any one particular community. Policymakers need to understand why that is. What is the feeling of unsafety and insecurity? And why is there a perceived benefit um, to a person carrying a firearm? Maybe they're right, right? And policy needs to understand that and work to make sure that policy and government is achieving its core responsibility of public safety, um, first and foremost, right? So to me, gun violence represents a breakdown that something wrong has happened with government and policy. Just I'm a policy person. That's where I come from. And so we need to understand what broke so that we can fix it. I would say the other reason that you have to have engaged community, communities is often when policy is passed, it's communities that at the end of the day are implementing it, right? Our state legislators aren't going to our houses and actually, right, so recently Connecticut passed uh, or made modifications to its secure storage law. Our legislators aren't going to our doors and securely storing guns should they be in a Connecticut home. 
that's up to the gun owner to do, right? And what does that look like in communities? How do we get the word out? How do we get the tools to securely store firearms and talk to people about their options for secure storage, right? Like communities are where the rubber meets the road. And if we're not engaging communities, um, then policy just has far less, less traction. Um, and it may um, be set up to fail from the onset if communities aren't engaged with it. Now, get, get, get Aisha. I was gonna say, um, I wanted to just um, support Kiri in everything that she shared. And I also believe that there's approach where we talk about community engagement, that we're very clear with our policy makers and research that it's a big difference between transactional work that happens with community engagement and then transformative, transforma transformative work, right? So it's a point of not being transactional with our community and util utilizing them just as a victim to say, hey, we know gun violence is an issue, right? Um, take their ideas and then never come back into engage. So as, as Carrie shared, like community are the ones who are going to be implementing. So it's very important that it's not transactional, but it's very transformative and tr transformative. This means engaging, talking, and then cycling back to say, hey, did we hear you correctly? And here are some of the policies that we're thinking about enacting. Is this what you're saying? Because a lot of times those who are um, victims and or those who are uh, most impacted are the ones who understand what the needs are, what the solutions are. And what happens sometimes is that policies, to Carrie's point, are put in place and there is no real understanding of how to do this, how this affects, and there's a lot of unintended consequences that happen with that. And so I just want to just highlight again what Carrie shared, that it's important to do the in community engagement. And I'll even take it a step forward is making sure that community is it throughout the process the whole time so that can be transformative and ensuring that they are not just being utilized as a research tool or as a way of like, yes, we heard from the community, but they're not fully engaged in the policy process. Can I say one more thing? Of course, yeah. Um, so I teach introduction to policy and management as one of the classes. And, you know, a core thing that we come back to over and over and over again throughout the semester is that policy is a process and it is incremental. And you don't just pass a policy and you check it off the list and you're done. No, you pass a policy, you evaluate it, you talk to people, you understand, did this do what it was supposed to do? Did it do more than it was supposed to do? That'd be great, right? Like what was the actual effect? And then like, what can we do better? Because policy is incremental because of how it's implemented, but also just because of how our, our policy process making works, which is not the scope of this conversation, but it, but we have to embrace the step-by-step -step nature and hope that we're making forward process, but in the event that we're not, to acknowledge that and course correct. Yeah, and I would add to what you guys both said is that it has to be a two-way street because our lawmakers also have to show up for our communities and they have to do it consistently. Otherwise, the community has no reason to trust the process or the system and to take time off of work to come and testify or to write testimony or to show up in any way, uh, whatever makes sense for them. What we talk about a lot at Hartford Communities at Care is sustainability. It's one thing for us to provide a level of service, but if, as you were saying, Carrie, that lawmakers are uh, thinking about a pilot program or investing with a time cap, or we talk a lot about the um, American Rescue Fund dollars that have come into our community, we want to continue to provide the same level of service and to sh keep showing up for folks. And that requires educating our lawmakers about how their decisions are affecting the community. The power imbalance between lawmakers and the community is large. And we need to try and close that gap as best we can by working to um, bring community to the table. But as I said, it has to be a two-way street. The lawmakers have to sit and, and be part of the process as well, or else there's no point. And what I heard from each of you is like kind of some core basic principles, right? Community engagement that includes actually listening to uh, the community members, you know, making sure the community is involved, not just on the front end, right, but also involved throughout the entire uh, process um, as well and understanding that, you know, a policy is it's a process, right? You know, it takes time uh, to develop policies. It takes time to pass policies. It also takes time for implementation um, as well. So understand that it's not just a, a
a short-term solution. This is like long-term uh, investment that legislators have to make and also community members have to make um, as well. So that's why it's that, it's that two-way street. You have to go uh, both ways, uh, which is uh, critical. Another key uh, part of this conversation uh, that I would love to hear from you all is the importance of engaging youth um, as well. Uh, many of our youth across the state of Connecticut are, are, are highly impacted by violence, whether it's directly or even exposed to uh, violence um, as well. We'd love to hear from each of you. Uh, you all can take uh, two to three minutes. We'd love to hear how have you uh, in, in fostered like student involvement or youth involvement into this work related to gun violence? Who would like to take that on first? I don't mind jumping in. Um, so um, two parts. Um, one, um, the the work that Compass um, does is a space of really ensuring that we're hearing not just from the staff who have been impacted, but also the young people. And so hearing from them and understanding their needs is important, right? And so in order to hear, like, we can't just be the people that say, you need this. It's important for us to say, and I'm saying us because I was a part and still love the organization, but it's important for us to really be able to say, take a step back and say, what do you really want? What will help you put your gun down? What will help you do this or that? Because if we come in as like the heroes and trying to save the day, then these wonderful programs that we all hear about, they're like, hey, we have the resources and we have this, but no one shows up. And it's because you actually didn't listen to the community about what they need. So that's the first part. Um, Compass really, really engages um, with the youth to hear what they are looking for. Um, for health equity solutions, um, the work that we do with the commissions on racial equity and inclusion, um, excuse me, racial equity and public health is really um, a space of hearing from the community and that involves young people too. So we have um, really been working to look at a strategic plan on how to engage not just adults, but young people too, and how that affects their health and how um, the criminal justice affects them as a whole, um, especially when it comes to um, violence. Um, and then the last thing that um, Health Equity Solutions we do is we do community listening sessions. Um, and we do this throughout the state and that involves um, young people as well. What we do is listen and hear from them and engage with them because they are our future leaders. And it's important to empower them to have them understand you already have a voice. We just wanna help amplify that and being able to listen and engage with the young people is helpful for one for us to create policies, um, excuse me, create policies that we will present to lawmakers. But number two, be able to have them understand that they are advocates and they know what they need. And we just, it's our ability to continue to push them forward to be able to do that work. Thank you, Aisha. Joanna? Hi. Yeah, thank you. So Hartford Communities That Care started 25 years ago at Fox Middle School as a program called Stump the Violence because violence that was happening at school was spilling out onto the streets and was escalating. And so we had an in-school installation that would help work with kids on mentoring, life skills, the whole family really, because we know that sometimes by the time a child arrives at school, they've already been through a whole day's worth of challenges, whether that's um, taking care of a younger sibling or not having the food that they need. There's all kinds of things that our kids run into before they even arrive at school. So having staff on site can really help. And uh, we've reinstated our in-school programs at two of our local schools in Hartford. We also have a youth leadership academy where kids meet every Saturday, um, kids who are in middle and high school, they identify problems in their lives and then take on the challenge of finding tangible solutions to those problems. They work all year on, on research. And then at the end of the school year, they present those solutions to their local um, and our state communities. And that includes our lawmakers, that includes their families, it includes our whole community. And in fact, they just left for Washington DC uh, this morning for the CADCA conference to present their findings and to learn more and to engage with youth from around the country. So really it's trying to uh, stop the violence before it starts by being in school where kids are and meeting them where they are and then also uh, engaging them as part of the solution and asking them to be at the table at every opportunity. 
because as you said, they're the future leaders and they're the ones who are going to be living in the world that we leave behind to them. So we're uh, always involving youth, always thinking of how um, their minds can come up with solutions that we haven't yet. Thank you. Carrie? So uh, sitting on a college campus, we engage with youth, I think, in a, in a unique way. Um, but I do also just want to acknowledge that UConn has multiple campuses, right? We have a campus in stores, but I actually sit on the Hartford campus. And so we have a very diverse student body who have a very different set of experiences from each other. So some of the things that we do is we listen to students. We have, you know, research networking uh, times and I go and put a table in the front lobby and just talk to youth about what their questions are about gun violence. And like, I think a lot of Americans, youth are passionate about gun violence and they want to do something about gun violence. And I support that. Um, but a lot of times there's a lot of misinformation about gun violence as well. And so we do a lot of work to um, try to correct that, um, right? The media, for example, mass shootings are sort of all over the media coverage. They, they get far more media coverage than they um, get in sort of uh, sort of actual time and space in terms of uh, occurrence and also death. Happens far too much. Please don't misunderstand. Uh, very, very much too much. However, um, the community gun violence that our communities experience, suicide rates, et cetera, are by far and away the most common ways that people die from guns in this country. And so having those conversations with youth and really sort of opening their eyes to the full complexity of gun violence is something that, that we do. And then I hope we also challenge them to think deeply about the solutions that they, that they may sort of um, come up with initially. And to think about that solution, is that the right solution? Would that work? Um, is that practical? What would that look like for communities if you implement it? Is that a community informed response uh, that you've just uh, said there, right? We've just talked about the need to have that voice. Where does that factor in, into that? And I think the final thing that we do, especially in the, um, the school that I'm in, which is the School of Public Policy, and, and what we try to do is, is train future public administrators and public servants is to also teach them to engage in what policy process evaluation looks like. How do you collect data? How do you put it into an Excel worksheet? How do you, how do you write a memo to concisely convey your point to a busy policymaker? And I know that sounds like how on earth is that relevant? But those core policy skills and translation and knowledge, we absolutely need more of that in gun violence prevention work. I would argue lots of social policy kind of work, but especially in gun violence prevention work. And so we train them to do that in classes, in conversation, in the forums that we have, place them in internships. We have students at Compass, right? So we do we do all of that work. And so I hope we engage um, our students who not, not all of them are youth, but right, we have some, we have students of all ages as well um, that come through our doors and really prepare them to engage thoughtfully and productively um, in this issue so that they can be real change makers. I just, um, I wanted to just jump in. I, I did forget the other work that I do. So Kiri just reminded me, um, I'm an adjunct at the School of Social Work for UConn and um, I teach political social work and we we encourage social workers to get involved politically. And so what we, what we do in I'd love to be a political social worker. So yay, go social workers. But um, what we do is we really work to like, uh, like Kiri shared about making sure that they're advocates. So youth can be described in so many different ways because we know that um, for schooling, it's, you know, a spectrum of, of age range. Um, but one of the bigger things that we love to do is really encourage individuals to get involved politically. So um, just like Kiri shared to like be able to go do testimonies and such and some of the projects that we have them do is really like what are your passion points and some of those have been those of gun control gun violence in all spectrum so not just community violence but gun control as defined earlier that Kiri shared um, they have really gone out and really testified or done memos about that work so just wanted to highlight that's another way 
um, I'll say UConn and also myself have really been supporting getting others involved in the process. And that is it's so, you know, just so important because part of, you know, uh, youth and young adult getting those policy skills, having that experience of providing uh, testimony and, and advocating, those are skills that many youth can translate to a career of being a legislator. The importance of like having legislators uh, in office that understand uh, these uh, issues, having legislators that also think differently from the the, the committee that they are uh, sitting on to really uh, challenge, right? You know, uh, a lot of the policies uh, that are uh, coming up as well. So it's just so important to engage youth and young, young adults uh, into uh, this work. When I was uh, young, I wish someone would have sat me down and talked to me about policy and talked to me about the importance of being a legislator, right? Because not only just related to, to, to gun violence, the importance of legislators have a lot of decision-making power over a lot of issues that impact our lives as well. So being able to give those uh, young people a, a, a key stakeholder status uh, in those skills is going to be, uh, continue to be extremely important. And, and you all give out some love you know, for those youth that are traveling to Washington, D.C., uh, to advocate as, as well, wish them a safe uh, travels and looking forward to uh, hearing or seeing on social media, right, about that experience of them uh, going to uh, D.C. as well. So we have a, a few more minutes before we get to the audience uh, Q&A. I see there are some uh, questions that have been uh, submitted already. Uh, we'd love to hear from, you know, uh, from you all. Um, you know, any of you all can answer this question, but for the past few years, you know, advocates, organizations uh, in Connecticut have been advocating, have been working to declare gun violence as a public health uh, crisis and want to dive a little bit deeper into like what role does the research play in helping to study uh, gun violence, also to adopt strategies and programs and policies that will help reduce uh, gun violence. Let's start with you, uh, Joanna, then go to Carrie Denaisha. Actually, I would love to hear from my colleagues on this first. Aisha, uh, you didn't unmute, so I, I will um, unmute. So, I mean, I think policy doesn't just play a role. I think it plays like the role in, in a lot of ways. Um, as David said in his opening remarks, so a lot of people will say that um, the United States has a gun violence epidemic. And that's true, I think. But actually, it has 51. Every state and jurisdiction has its own version of what um, gun violence looks like there, right? Connecticut has one of the lowest rates. Mississippi homicides far are, are the leading cause of gun violence. Uh, Utah, it's suicide are the leading cause of gun violence. But all of this comes down as well to, to health. I mean, death is a health outcome. Death is, it, it, you're not, you're, if you are dead, you are not healthy. It is the cessation of health. And so we have to think about how is this same outcome of gun violence manifesting in different ways across the United States, across populations? And, and we have to understand it, and that's the role of research. But I think the role of the public health response is to say, okay, there are multiple ways that we can work to prevent gun violence. We can do this in a primary prevention model, which is sort of helping everybody that may not have an obvious risk factor for gun violence and helping to reduce their risk. This can be secondary uh, gun violence. So there's someone that has a particular risk factor uh, and we want to reduce their risk. Maybe it's a person in an intimate partner relationship. We know that that greatly increases a woman's risk of intimate partner homicide. If there's a firearm in the house, that's going to greatly increase her risk of intimate partner gun homicide. Okay, so now there's a secondary and we need to do something. Or there's tertiary prevention, which is a person has been um, shot, maybe they show up in an ER, and now what do we do to make sure they don't come back to the ER, right? And research can tell us what to do with each one of these steps, but it also means that we need a continuum of care. And I think this continuum of care is where public health really excels, but where things like criminal justice, where we have really sort of thought about gun violence um, in a long time, although I would argue that only thinks about a small subset of gun violence, right? 
suicide is not a crime in most instances, unless it's a suicide homicide. But this continuum of care and really thinking about the whole person and thinking about their risk factors and thinking about what, what are the things that I need to do to keep you safe in your particular environment with the challenges and opportunities that you bring to the table? Like, what are the things I need to do for you and in your community? That's what public health is good at. And we have to research what those inputs are and then combine them with the public health system. And I think then we've got some traction of how we how we reduce gun violence in this country. I hope that answered your question. It was a big question. That was a lot of my it, 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 it more than answered uh, the question. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, curious to hear from you, Aisha. So um, when we're talking about any type of declaration, um, especially like declaring public health, um, gun violence a public health crisis, it involves some type of legislation, right? And in order for to get unfortunate, like, and I'm using the word unfortunately, but in order to get the attention of individuals, you need some sort of research and data collection, whether that's at a local, state, and or federal level. And so being a former elected official, sometimes you don't know which you don't know unless someone brings it to your attention. And so research, data, all of these things are important when you're bringing it to a person who is passing policy. And so for me, it's very, very important. Um, once the declaration happens, I always say, and what? Right. And so as a state, we declare racism a public health crisis. Right. Wonderful declaration. After that became steps. What were the steps are that we're going to take in order to address racism in our state with declaring public with declaring gun violence a public health crisis an a commendable step that the state of Connecticut can take. And then what? So once we do once we do the declaration, we take the data and the research that was given to do the declaration and then create policies, strategies, implementation to suburb it, right? And we have to continue to dig. And so one the 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 biggest problem that I've seen is that what are we what are we looking at to de define again, you asked that question right at the top. What are we defining as gun violence? And what does how do we create this public health crisis in order to support it, right? As we know, um, gun violence is one of the highest rates of death, right? And so it's then breaking it down into the subcategories that Carrie had shared to say, here's the different research ways and projects because we can't research the same way for all of the different topics. And they are all not gonna have the same outcome. And so the declaration one, you need the research and the data. The number two is after the declaration happens, we have to ensure that the way that the language is written for the declaration, that it makes sense to address all of the different um, ways that we define gun violence. And understanding that that research to have a shift and change to one, what the part that you said you share the to reduce gun violence, right? We will have to figure out it's different for each category that we're defining gun violence. And so to straight answer your question, very important. We need research and data. The second part is we need to, after the declaration, continue to have that dialogue of what this look like, what this looks like, and making sure that the research, the data, the strategies, the programs are conducive for how we're defining each category category under gun violence. Yeah, I would agree with that completely. And um, we, I think, we talk a lot about the fact that gun violence doesn't have one singular cause, that it's really a symptom of larger issues. And all of those larger issues are within the public health sphere. So by that uh, perspective, gun violence is a public health issue. And to look at it this way is really a pretty new thing. This lens is pretty new, but I think it allows for some of that conflict to be taken out of it. There's so much political conflict around guns and around gun restrictions and gun laws. But if we talk about it with a public health lens, if we say this is the result of somebody not getting their needs met, uh, then it, the conversation shifts. And that's really important. And I think that's why we're um, 
I'm really proud of the work we did to help establish this commission at the Department of Public Health on Community Violence Intervention and Prevention. It's uh, appointed by the legislature of subject matter experts across the field of violence prevention to advise the legislature on how policy and resources can have the most impact across the state. And when we talked about gun violence, Carrie, you mentioned a continuum and we, we look at it through that lens too. We say that it's um, prevention, intervention, treatment and recovery because just like any other systemic illness, uh, that affects a community, there are steps along the way. And just like gun violence doesn't have any one uh, reason why it's happening, it doesn't have one solution either. And so it's gonna take all of us looking at it through this lens of public health from our different corners of expertise to be able to come to the table and have a patchwork of solutions that's gonna help each individual where they need to be helped. So to meet people where they are and to offer them the kind of help that's gonna best uh, improve their outcomes. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists. Thank you, Aisha, Carrie, and Johanna. Uh, Want to open up? We have a lot of questions uh, from uh, the audience, so we'd love to open up for uh, Q and A. Kate. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kiki and I'm a director of alumni relations. So we're going to move into our Q&A program. Before I get started by asking some of our panelists some questions, um, just please continue to put them in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we asked for questions ahead of time. So we're going to start with some of those. We received a lot of great questions um, from folks. Um, so thank you um, to those of you who submitted questions when you registered. Um, we received a lot of similar questions, so we combined them when we could. Um, and unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all the questions. So with that in mind, I'll um, kind of kick us off. Um, a lot of people ask questions about how to talk to other people about gun violence um, and um, gun injury prevention. So we heard we heard from a lot of people about their challenges with this. Some people live in communities that might not be receptive to these conversations or in states where the policy landscape looks really different than Connecticut's, or they're just talking to people who have very different beliefs or um, life experiences um, with guns. So do you do any of you have suggestions on sort of how to navigate these types of conversations when talking with other people? This is a really tough one. And we find it in every conversation that we have, there's gonna be differences. Um, I'll start with a story because it sort of informed the way that I think about it. So um, every year, our three hospitals and other stakeholders host a community gun buyback across the state. Um, and these gentlemen came in and they said, oh, don't you just want to take our guns away? Isn't this just an excuse to get our guns? And we said, no, we want to keep you safe. So if giving up your gun today makes you safe, then yes, we want it. But if that's not the case and you want a trigger lock or you want a gun safe or you want to talk about other things, we're happy to have the conversation. But we could start from that common ground is like, no, we just want to keep you safe and, and find out the best way to do that. So finding a common starting point and then talking about exactly what it was that they're concerned about, because sometimes there's a lot of noise out there and you don't you could repeat a talking point and not really understand where it came from or why. But, you know, what is your fear? What what are you worried is going to happen to you? And then let's go step by step on how we can mitigate that fear and then also move forward into um finding common ground and solutions. It's not perfect. And there are always going to be people that won't agree with you. But I've always found um, really asking them to dig into and be self reflective about what are they specifically afraid of is helpful. And I'll say for me, uh, one of the things that we use that compass was this idea of ready, willing and able. Um, it's difficult to have a conversation with the person about something so sensitive like this if they're not ready to have that conversation. And so I take that with any conversation that I have. I kind of assess, is this person ready to have this conversation? Because you never want to force a conversation for someone who's not ready. And then when they're ready, then it's like, okay, they're willing. 
right? They're willing to engage and they're willing to now have a dialogue and be um, hopefully respectful for each positionality or position, excuse me. And then able, once you're at that point of able, it's like, okay, now they're like, hey, how could I make a difference? Or I never really thought about like that. And maybe I should shift and, and do things differently. So those are just, a that's a, just a key thing that I always keep in mind when you're having difficult conversations, especially something like this. The other lesson um, that I've learned specifically for talking about gun violence or even just a t sticky conversations, it was learned during COVID-19. Many, many, many folks across the state or even just the nation talked about vaccines and how people were mistrusting and how people just did not want, specifically black and brown individuals were not engaged in wanting to have the vaccine. What we learned is that it took it it was a space of no one really went down to where they were, whether it's a barbershop or hair salon or faith-based organizations and really talked and engaged, right? And really here to to what Johanna said, it's like, what are your fears? What are your thoughts? What's going on? What it, when we use the word safe um gun regulation, what does that mean to you? And not place judgment, but really being able to have a dialogue to not make it a us versus you, but really a space of like, I just really want to hear from you and then be able to engage differently. What happens is that many people come in and say, you should have this and you should have that, or we, we should have control, but not necessarily hearing from all the perspectives. Or it's easy to say that young person needs to put down that gun hey, this I, we have many stories of young people who have been either attacked or felt threatened when they're going from a school bus to school and they're carrying the gun because for protection, right? And so there's so many different aspects and avenues. So it's just, for me, it's, I've learned that when you're having difficult conversations, one, respect the person as a human and that they have thoughts and feelings and reasons on why they believe the way that they believe. And then really engaging um, with that sensitive topic with curiosity. I agree. I would say that there are things that I know to be true and I know them. I know that they're true, but I only know that because of my lived experience that brought me to that place. And so when I'm engaging in conversation with somebody who knows that something completely opposite is true, then I have to recognize that it's their lived experience that brought them to that place. And how do we explore those experiences so that we can have the conversation? And I just put something into the chat that um, brings it's a it's from an organization called Starts with Us, and they have a how to have like a polarizing conversation sort of toolkit, and it actually uses a lot of the words that Johanna and Aisha talked about. They frame it around curiosity, compassion, and courage. There's a different question in the chat that talks about gun laws in Tennessee. They actually did some focus groups in Tennessee after the Coventry school shooting and brought together very diverse voices in Connecticut to try to figure out what common ground was. And on that, I wanna say this issue is divisive, but it's not always divisive. Most Americans actually support, for example, universal background checks. Many Americans support red flags or ERPO laws or extreme risk protection orders. There are a lot of places where we have common ground and I would also urge us to think about starting there. The final thing I would say in terms of having a conversation, I'm a mother of small children. Uh, guns are the leading cause of death of children in this country. And one conversation that I am always careful to have if my children are going to someone else's house are lots of safety conversations. Is there gonna be an adult home? Who's gonna be there? If you have a firearm in your house, is it securely stored? And I would really encourage you to think about also having those conversations, not just about what we think or what we feel, but about what are we doing and how does that impact your personal safety and that of your family? Thank you all for sharing some of those tips um, and also kind of, again, focused on grounding, finding common ground and finding um, sort of common values with those that you're you're um, having conversations with. Um, I'm also curious, we've heard um, tonight, folks, some of you all, um, also David, uh, folks who have personal experience um, with gun violence um, or are survivors of gun violence. So I'm wondering how we can center survivors in the work that we're doing, the conversations we're having. And as well, I don't know if you want to get us started with that, but I'm um, just kind of thinking about um, whose who's stories um, we're, we're amplifying. 
Yeah, I think, you know, one one of the most important things is really taking the time uh, to listen uh, directly uh, to individuals and families that's been impacted by uh, gun violence. You know, I've been uh, doing this work, you know, since I got shot in 2009, right? And it wasn't until I joined my uh, organization when someone, you know, asked me, what was that experience like for you? Like, tell me more, like, deeply, what were you experiencing psychologically? What, you know, what were some of the physical challenges uh, that you uh, were having? Um, and, and so just being able to begin to listen to, you know, especially Black men. Uh, Black men are often uh, most harmed by uh, gun violence, but we are often least supported um, a, a, as well. So being able to listen to, provide spaces to listen to uh, individuals and family that's been impacted by uh, gun violence. And I think when you do that, as, as Aisha mentioned early, like we are the experts. We know what we actually uh, need uh, to better support us. We also know the things that helps prevent uh, violence from happening is the ensuring, I think David talked about this uh, earlier, the importance of like, you know, uh, economic stability uh, for uh, families uh, and, and communities, the importance that housing also plays uh, in uh, you know, this issue that, that, that we have of, of gun violence um, as well. So it's really starting to have these uh, conversations, but providing the spaces, those safe spaces, those trauma-informed uh, spaces for people to share uh, those stories and, and, and how we do that as a organization is that we provide peer-to-peer -peer support uh, to survivors and we bring uh, survivors together um, to share those experiences. And what often come out of that are policy ideas um, and also programs uh, that that we need to really help build this infrastructure of support uh, in communities. For me, those are the things uh, that we don't do much. It's actually listening to uh, people who've been impacted uh, directly uh, by it, and, and that impact is not just short term. That impact is long uh, term um, as well. So that's that continuum of care uh, that's needed uh, for anyone who's been impacted by uh, gun violence, whether you're in inner city community or rural. Uh, neighborhoods, you know, it's, it's universal. Our experiences are the same uh, when you are impacted by gun violence. I think it's so important too to empower survivors in the way that makes sense for them. For some, it's working with them to write testimony, uh, to give to the Capitol, to testify on behalf of a bill that will make change. For some, it's telling their story to others. For some, it's helping them find a group of other survivors that can help them feel less isolated, but really listening to survivors and asking them what is going to be the most helpful to empower them. For some, it's just getting out of bed is going to be a, a triumph and a success and, and the best thing that we can do for them. And for others, it's helping them get onto a national stage to tell their story about what could have made a difference in their community. So really meeting them where they are, listening to them and helping them get to the place where they feel empowered because it can be so so it can, there's such a feeling of helplessness when you're a victim. And so gaining back the reassurance that your voice matters and that your life matters is, is uh, critical. I would also love to see us expand the definition of survivor. Um, men are the most likely to die from guns, either by homicide or suicide. When that happens, two types of people are the most likely to be left behind. Their children and sometimes a woman that loved them, maybe their mother or maybe an intimate partner. And those people are left behind to pick up the pieces of a, of a life that is torn apart. And, and what are we doing for those survivors as well? It's a very different kind of survivor when I worked for the district attorney's office, we had a survivor's visual after homicide and the survivors that we were coming around were the people who were still alive and for whom the bullet never touched physically, but touched them in every other way. And so we have got to really think about survivors is not just a bullet has hit your body and you are here to tell us about it. I am glad you are here to tell us about it. It's also the people that lost a loved one um, or are helping a loved one to heal. And so I, I, we really just have to think about there's power in community and, and expanding that definition. Absolutely. Thank you all. Um, I also want to touch on mental health a little bit. Um, we did also receive a lot of questions about that. And so I think when there are incidents of gun violence, 
um, often mass shootings, but also in communities. I feel like mental health is often cited as the cause um, or a cause, right? Um, and so how can we talk about mental health um, and gun violence in a way that doesn't perpetuate stereotypes, further stigmatize mental health, and also, I guess it's kind of a two, one of those combined questions, like talking about supporting communities, supporting survivors um, and their mental health as well. Um, I would say the first thing is that we have to change the narrative of what mental health is. Um, and so that's just, I know that's not even what we're talking about here, but to your point, if we change a narrative of mental health, um, I think that that will shift the dynamics if what we're when we're tying it to certain things. Um, there needs to be a more um, campaigns. I use the word campaigns, but more campaigns or communication about what mental health is. Right? Many people think mental health is a space of like they'll use the word, and I know it's not politically correct right word to say. It's like I'm not crazy, right? That's that's not what just mental health is, right? And I think that narrative plays out, which causes a lot of like. Oh, I don't need the services. The second part is um, distilling the stigma and many of, and I'll speak from a, from in black and brown communities, the stigma of mental health services is that I don't need it and I don't need to tell anyone what my issues are. And so really being able to curve that and really talk more about ways of seeking therapy or talking to someone, these are important. Um, when it comes to gun violence, more community violence, and even for mass shootings and suicide, I think it's also important for us to not always think about mental health treatment to be a space of like a therapy. It could be more space of like a theory, really being able to go down into the community and meet the needs of that. What I mean by that is Compass um, utilizes a technique where they're engaging with the young person in a space of let's go bowling, right? I'll give an example, let's go bowling and implementing CBT tools um, at that space and really engaging and talking with them versus them going into an office and sitting down on a sofa, right? And I think that's a way to really start engaging and shifting dynamic the, the dynamics of mental health issues or mental health as a whole and changing what historically individuals would, would um, deem mental health to be. So just my, my thoughts. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would also add to just keep talking about it when there's not a crisis. And because we really need to normalize the fact that reaching out for help for your mental health is on parallel with asking for help for your physical health. It's a part of keeping your whole person healthy. And then I would just say it's so important to expand access to mental health tools into the neighborhoods where this is happening the most. Because if mental health care is seen as something you know, with a barrier to access, if it's something you can't reach, even if you wanted to, either because your schedule, your insurance, or your neighborhood doesn't allow access to those things, then it just becomes something further away and continues to be seen as either a, a tool for those who are privileged or something that white people do. And that's something I think we really need to change. And, and I would just say, so, uh, Dr. Matt Miller has a study where he looks specifically at suicide and mental health and suicide rates are not predicted by mental health per se, but they are predicted by access to guns. And so for people that are having um, ideations of self-harm or other violent ideations, access to guns turns out to be a very dangerous combination. And so we do need tools when we do see that um, risk that a person is a risk to themselves or others. We need tools to be able to act swiftly and in a way that preserves that person safety and the safety of those around them. Um, and so, so we do need those in instances where, where it sort of is that stereotypical mental health break. We absolutely do need that. Things like ERPOs, secure storage, some states have maps to tell you if there's secure storage outside of your home. So maybe you don't want to relinquish a gun to law enforcement per se, but maybe there is a, a safe place that you can take the gun that the person who's having a, an episode would be much safer if it were there. 
I also think that this pertains to older folks as they start to experience dementia and other kinds of um, wellness changes um, that, again, it's just normal and natural, but it's going to put people at risk of harm. And, and we do need to have open conversations that are focused on safety and not stigma. Hey, thank you all. Um, we'll wrap up our Q&A. Um, again, thank you all for uh, those who submitted questions. Um, I know we didn't get to all of them. We are happy to share the questions with our panelists. We send resources out um, after the call. And if there are sort of any resources um, that might address some of the questions folks had, um, we'll be sure to share those as well. I'm gonna turn it back over to you as well to wrap us up, um, talk about some key takeaways and action items for everyone. Awesome, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, and today has just been such a, a valuable uh, conversation. We heard so much insight, you know, and expertise, but also concrete solutions uh, to address uh, gun violence. You know, we know that this is a cycle that we need uh, to interrupt. You know, we've heard from organizations on, on how we define uh, gun violence, which is broad, right? It also must be customized uh, to uh, different uh, community groups and individuals. Um, as well. And we've heard just such amazing work. And I see also the organizations in the chat box who are, are doing this important work across uh, the country, responding to gun violence, providing uh, case management services that provide support to families in the short term and also in the uh, long term um, as well. We've also heard the important role that research uh, plays in documenting and understanding the impact of gun violence and how we can use uh, research to better prevent uh, gun violence from happening in the first place um, as well. And, and, and part of all of our work, we've all touched on this uh, today, uh, which was the importance uh, that that policy right plays uh, in this, uh, this issue uh, related to uh, gun violence and how we need to make sure that as community members and also as policymakers as well, that we are being more authentic as it relates to engaging each other uh, on both sides uh, and the importance of uh, the community engagement that includes listening to uh, community members, making sure community members are involved throughout the entire uh, process. And what we heard today was that policy is, is, is a long-term uh, process and also implementation is a process um, as well. And I know I'm here with such uh, amazing panelists uh, and audience uh, members who we're here because we care about gun violence. You know, you are here because you care about survivors, you care about uh, safety. And for many of you, you know, we are you know on the East Coast in the evening. Many of you have joined today's uh, conversation after a very uh, long uh, work day, right? Which was most likely included helping and supporting uh, people um, as well. So we know this work is critical. So I just wanna thank you all for joining us uh, today. This is not just a, a one-time conversation that we want. Uh, to have. You heard about several community organizations like Compass Youth uh, and also Harper Communities uh, That Care. Um, we, you heard also about the importance of you can play in policy. Uh, Connecticut is in a legislative session that starts uh, February 7th. So if you want to get involved to testify, to meet with your uh, legislators, you can do that um, as well, or participate in uh, several uh, commissions that are also will be holding uh, meetings and hearings like the Commission on Racial Equity and Public Health. Uh, that Aisha mentioned, and also the uh, Commission on Com Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention that Johanna uh, mentioned um, as well. But we cannot end this conversation and really uplift the important role that research uh, plays as well. So if you want to get involved in the Yukon Arms, uh, go on the website, uh, connect with Kerry um, as well. And my final uh, thoughts is that, you know, for those of you who have firearms, uh, please secure uh, those uh, firearms, talk with your, your loved ones, your neighbors, uh, your community members on the importance of securing uh, firearms as well. So thank you so much to the UConn alumni uh, team. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, thank you so much to our amazing panelists. Uh, thank you to David and Kathleen uh, for opening us up today. And thank you so much to our uh, audience who joined us for this valuable uh, conversation. So thank you so much for being part of today's uh, This is America event on Surviving uh, gun violence, and we'll talk to you all uh, soon. We'll follow up with more uh, resources as well. And thank you to you, Aslod, for your wonderful moderating. Yeah, First. absolutely. Thank you for your time tonight. First, thank you all. Looking forward to working together. Mm -hmm.